duplicate the environmental conditions of real life on our structures, rolling stock, and locomotives. That's the artistry of model railroading. One of the most exciting people in model railroading today is Malcolm Furlow. You've seen his photos and read his articles in Model Railroad. Now we're here in Dallas to get him to teach us his techniques. Weathering Railroad Models with Malcolm Furlow. Presented by Model Railroader Magazine. Hi, Sharon Furlow. Hi, Alan. How are you doing? Fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. Where's Malcolm? Well, he's putting some finishing touches on the layout, so if you don't mind, he sent me to come and pick well, you great. up. Great. Let's go. I hope you brought the limo. What house? It's right over here. <clears throat> that was quite a ride. Glad you liked it. <laughs> oh. We'd like to get uh, Malcolm to show us how he weathered the wood, metal, plaster, and plastic on his Denver and Rio Chama Western and the San Juan Central. It should be a lot of fun. Well, let me show you where Malcolm holds himself captive. Here, why don't you give me your bag? Um, this is as far as I'm going to go, and I just want you to remember one thing, Alan. From now, you're on your own. One of the most important aspects of weathering is observation. When I started working on the Denver and Rio Chama Western, I was also nursing a consuming interest in photography. When this project was just an idea, I took my camera and I headed to Colorado to do some first-hand research. I developed a quest for realism in my Colorado expedition. Though there's no real mining town of Sheridan in Colorado, and though it's no longer 1890, the remnants of many of the mountain towns still linger along one of the old narrow gauge lines, the Cumberson Toltec. You know, I rode that rail from Chama, New Mexico to Ananito, Colorado, and man, I took a lot of slides. Later, I drove back through some of these areas to look a little closer and to linger, taking close-up shots of rock formations, old, distressed, weathered and aged wood, metal and stone structures, observing all the effects that weathering and aging that nature plays on itself and man-made things. So I joined reality and fantasy to depict what the eye perceives in life, and I converted it to the fictional scale town of Sheridan. It became so real to me that I even wrote fiction articles about it at the turn of the century. It became an idea that I just couldn't get rid of. And it developed into all of this. A model railroad must be constructed right, architecturally correct and proper scale and perspective. You know, it's one thing to build a model, but it's a whole other thing to age and weather it. In many instances, the character of weathering must be built in before actually constructing the model. It's the art of weathering that brings realism to the layout, that turns that sterile setting into an artistic rendering, and it brings it on the line. It's my contention that it all begins with observation. Hey, man, what are you doing here? I just came by to take a ride on the Redding. <laughs> you mean the Denver and Rio Chama Western? Do not pass go, do not collect $200. <laughs> How you doing, Alan? Good, and you? I can't complain. So this is the famous Denver and Rio Chama Western. This is it. Hey, listen, I bet it's a little bit uh, smaller than you first thought. Yeah, you sure know how to fool the eye. Why don't you show us how you perform some of that magic? I'm ready. Why don't we just head on up to the workshop? The basic modeling materials are wood, metal, plaster, and plastic. Malcolm used them all on his railroad. Let's have him show us right now how he does wood. You know, for simulating wood, there's nothing really better than using the real thing. In fact, much of Sheridan's made of wood. You'll notice that I've built in the weather look as I built Sheridan. This requires planning before constructing the cars or structures. And my wood techniques can be used on all models made of wood. Peeling paint is peeling paint, whether it's on a car or a building, and uh, the ways of achieving it are, are basically the same. But before I get too specific, why don't we begin with some general weathering techniques? Like in real life, wind, water, and the sun take their toll on wood, as they've done on these buildings. Okay, let's start the techniques of distressing and texturing wood on a larger than usual size. For convenience, I'm gonna work with a strip of balsa about an inch thick, and what I'm doing here might be applied to a building or a bridge, or it might be used for the sides of a car. And you see, what we wanna do first is add a little bit deeper grain, because this is, this is obviously uh, not deep enough, so what I do is I take a, an X-Acto saw blade that you can purchase at the hobby store, 
draw it along the grain lines of the wood and just dig in a little bit deeper grain. Now what this is going to do, it's going to raise the fibers up a little bit. So what you want to do is come back after you've done that with a wire brush, and just brush the grain to remove those fuzzy members that you don't want to be sticking up later on. Just brush it right on out. You might want to come in there too if it's really rough and use a little sandpaper just to kind of knock off, smooth down the edges, just a tad. You don't have to use the sandpaper too much. You know, there's knot holes and there's splits in wood and there's uh, a whole lot of distressing things that we can add to wood, but one way that you can do it real quick and easy is take a round file and you can uh, just take the jeweler's file, just make a little indenture in the wood, not too deep, wherever you want a knot hole. Just make these knot holes just like this. Come back with an X-Acto knife, a number 11 blade, draw around the knot hole. Just draw around it like this, okay? This will all pick up stain later on. Okay, after distressing and texturing the wood, we want to finish it, and this requires the application of washes and stains. Take driftwood stain, which is our base coat. Now, this being balsa, is going to readily uh, absorb this stuff. You can see how fast it goes in, so it's going to take a lot of it, but we'll just coat this in, because this is the base coat that we want to work from. This gives our wood a uh, nice weathered appearance and gives us a good base coat to start from. I like to come in with maple, these are all flocal stains, and uh, they can be purchased at the hobby store, along with their regular colors. Dip the brush in. It doesn't really matter if the brush is coated with the previous stain, because we're all going to kind of bleed this thing together. And what I like to do is tilt this wood up to let this stain flow in the grain, okay? Put it on pretty heavy. Let it flow. You know, you want to touch it here and touch it there. Put it in the knot holes. This is uh, dirt that has been bought at the hobby store, it's been sifted, it's, it's from the company called Rock Quarry. We pour a little bit of this dirt out right onto the paper right here. Just take your fingers, pick up the dirt, drop it on in different areas and rub it in. Just take your finger and rub it in, just like that, okay? Now usually you'll want to wait till this, uh, till the staining procedure is real good and dry before you do this, but like I say, for the sake of time, we want to just kind of keep moving here. Now let me stress that anywhere in this process you want to stop is okay, you know, as long as you've got the effect or the color that you're after. Now what I like to do is I like to come back with just clear thinner right out of the can, right out of a focal can, and just add drops of thinner here and there, and you see it, it creates kind of a molted effect in different areas. It washes the dirt away here and stains it in here. This is a real good basis for a start. There are many colors to choose from, and the more that you get into it, the more you'll feel free to experiment and dabble and come up with your own techniques. Malcolm, that sure does look good, is it, but is there a simpler way to do it? Well, there's a tried and true way that's been used by many modelers over the ages, and it's quick and it's not as time consuming. Why don't we set up and try to do a little bit of that? Okay. In thin solutions, it'll give a basic dried and worn look. In thicker applications, it resembles creosote, so you can use it for trestles, bridges, and cross ties. Take some India ink and dilute it with rubbing alcohol about 30 to 1, 30 parts to 1. Uh, then I like to take a piece of balsa wood, and before we actually apply the India ink solution, we want to coat this much as we did the first piece with a uh, base coat of driftwood. Let it dry. Do whatever distressing you're going to do. Now, what we want to do here is take a brush, load the brush up, a, a hard bristle brush, and just start flowing this on in here. Now, you can see how dark this goes in, but as it dries, it lightens up. Now you see where we place these nail holes. The way we do that is with, I, what, what I use is a little dental pick, but you can use a straight pin. A straight pin makes a nice uh, uh, hole effect, nail hole effect. And uh, when you flow on the stain, the stain will find its way into these crevices like this and accentuate them. We can also use this solution to accentuate and make uh, wood look like it's real rotten, like it's really been worn. I've done a piece over here that I've, I've pre-weathered, and you can see I've kind of aged the end of this. But if I really wanted to pop that out even more, I could go into this solution here and just touch the interior, okay? Drag it down where these uh, distress marks are, just like this, and you can see how it pops out that area. Look at that. It just really gets in there and just looks like it's just kind of moldy. Moving right along, let me stress that what we've done up to now, before we painted anything, is that we've taken wood and made it look like wood, aged and weathered. Now let me show you how I do my peel paint technique. 
To begin with, let's take some rubber cement, the kind that you buy when you want to paste up pictures or photos or whatever. Just kind of dab this rubber cement just like this, here and there. D don't coat the wood thoroughly with it because, like, you know, we're just after a peel paint effect. I'm using a spray can here of green, okay? Just coat it just like that, just like you would normally do the sides of a building or a car. This will work on rolling stock or whatever. You want to let that dry just a bit, and then we're going to come back with uh, some tape, something sticky, scotch tape or whatever. In this case, we're using some duct tape. And you can just place this tape and just kind of rub this in and lift up this peel paint. See, so just dab it. See how that's lifting the paint off? Now, normally I would wait for this paint to cure more, but you can tell that it is coming off. It leaves a rough, jagged edge, much as in peel paint on a prototype building. Just peel that off. Really leaves a neat effect. And this peel paint technique works the same for wood, plastic, plaster, or metal. Okay, now we're going to work with styrene. Styrene is a plastic product that can be used to simulate wood or metal. And I don't normally use it to, to uh, simulate wood, but a lot of modelers like it because it goes together so quickly using liquid cement. Styrene comes in strips and sheets like balsa and basswood. Evergreen scale models markets it. To simulate wood, texture to stress the smooth surface of the styrene with the same steps we used when we were working with wood. But instead of the base coat we used on wood, why don't we use Floquil Foundation, a good plastic primer and sealer. Its natural tan color makes it a good first coat. What I do is I let it cure a couple of days, then I come back with the stains and washes, such as focal maple. Before the base coat, we want to distress the styrene, much in the same manner as we did with the wood members and uh, with the same tools. And first, we want to use this X-Acto saw blade, drawing it along the strip in this manner, adding grain. Come back with a wire brush to clean up the area. Take away the uh, raised fuzzy type members off this thing. If you want knot holes, now's a good time to put them in. The same way we did with wood, just kind of pierce, pierce the area. A good base coat to use, as I said before, is Floquil Foundation. It just gives us a nice wood tone color. Just flow it on, just like this. Okay, you want to let this whole thing set for about a day. Now, the next thing you want to do is you want to flow on some stains, much in the same manner as we did with wood. What I'm going to use here is maple stain, which is kind of a dark stain. What you'll have when you finish is something that'll look basically like this after you float on all the stains. We even used India ink in here, and we came back and dry brushed with white a little bit later on to pop out the grain. To simulate metal and the weathering effects of rust, oxidation, and corrosion, I like to work with styrene. Much of the simulated metal on my latest layout, the San Juan Central, is done with uh, styrene like this tin roof, for instance. Now, you can see that this roof has been coated with Pactra Light Earth, which is a flat color. We spray that on as a base coat. Next, I want to come with Tuscan, Flocal Tuscan, okay? That'll give us two shades of rust. I'm just going to kind of spray this on, kind of randomly hitting it. Not a whole lot, just a little bit here and there. And you just dip your brush in the thinner. Move this around. Now, you can't do a whole lot with styrene and thinner because, uh, like I say, the, star, the uh, thinner will attack the styrene. But streak it. You want to streak it in a manner like this. Just move the colors around. That's all we want to do. You know, if it looks a little gross right now, don't worry about it. Let's go out and get some dirt. And what I got was uh, when I went to on a trip to Colorado, I picked up some red type dirt. You can purchase this type of color at the hobby store. Uh, Rock Quarry markets it. Just take this roof, dig it into the dirt, cover the dirt, cover the uh, piece with the dirt, move it around. Okay, shake it around in the box a little bit. Just have fun with it, right? You want the dust to accumulate on there. Work it into the grooves with your finger. Okay, just like that. Just work it in. It's already looking really good. It's looking like rust. That really looks nice. Take a little bit more thinner, okay? Just a little bit here and there. Just kind of dab it on. See how it runs? And it's going to give us those light and dark areas of real rust, real corrosion. Okay, look at that. It really works really neat. It's so easy to do. It's a lot of fun. But as the styrene dries, well, you'll have a real nice effect. Just let it run down through the grooves. Okay, you can even streak it to a degree. 
Should you desire a pure paint effect, just uh, simply add the rubber cement and go through the steps that I showed you for wood. Another material available at hobby shops to uh, simulate metal is metal itself. Keystone and Campbell Market metal foil that resembles corrugated siding or roofing. Corrugated metal is one of the most popular form in industrial building materials. And it was mass produced beginning, oh, in the 1890s. It can be used on layouts from then on. Would you believe that we can weather and simulate corrugated metal roofing to look this good using a chemical etching that you can purchase at Radio Shack? And this is it right here. You can use this, and it is an acid, and once you've used it, you can neutralize the acid with baking soda and plain water. Pour it full strength into a cup. Take tweezers and pick up the pieces. I suggest you use rubber gloves because this stuff is dangerous. It's an acid that literally eats the metal or your skin. Now what we've done is we've pre-painted a piece of this corrugated metal. This is a Campbell corrugated uh, metal roofing. Dip the piece in the cup and, and not for long. It takes some experimenting to see how long, maybe oh, 10 or 20 seconds at first. Use your eyes and watch what it's doing. As you can see, it's smoking a bit. Notice that the acid doesn't attack the paint. It really just attacks the metal underneath. When the acid has worked enough, you stop the etching process by dipping the piece into a cup of water with a couple of teaspoons of uh, baking soda in it. This will neutralize the acid. Now let me show you a few other things you can do to weather metal. Now we have a green truck here. And, uh, you know, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time on weathering these islands because you have so much to do in building your layout. Just move the box over. And we've got a box of rusty colored dirt here. What I'm going to do is just put the the car in here, run it around a little bit in this dirt. Make sure that you work the dirt into the paint. If it scratches it, that's fine because it's gonna make it look old and weathered and add a little character to it. To seal this rust on here, just take a little bit of this flat finish from Flocal, just get back a little bit. You don't wanna get too close to it because it'll knock off the, the dust. Just barely hit it here and there, okay? Move around the car or the truck, just hit it. You want those uh, rust patches thick here and light there. Just take a stiff bristle brush, dip it in a little poly S white just in the corner, okay? This is dry brushing. You want to get most of the uh, white off the brush, just dampen the ends of the brush. And you want to just, what we're going to do is highlight the car. We're going to simulate a little sunlight, okay? Dry brush it. Dry brush the windows, the curves of the car or the truck. See how that pops out the lines? On a layout, you're not going to see these tires because there's not sunlight. We don't have the light power that we have outdoors. So go in and, and dry brush a little bit along the edges of the truck. Not only does it weather it, it looks like the paint has been peeled off, and it highlights it at the same time. That's all there is to it. The last structure medium we need to have Malcolm show us is masonry. That includes brick and stone. Plaster and plastic are the most common masonry modeling materials. Both come in sheets of prefab walls with the brick and stone already embossed in. There are a number of companies that make masonry walls in brick or stone, and uh, many of these kits use these materials. Out of the box, though, they're usually white. Now, you can carve every brick or stone into a scratch-built structure if that's what you really want to do, but it's really time-consuming and tedious. But let me take you through the basic masonry prep or weathering on the ready-made products. First with a sheet of the plastic, like the Holgate and Reynolds, and then with a plaster casting, like Sheridan. There's really not much to it. Now with the plastic brick, you want to decide on the color. I think we're going to use boxcar red for this. And all you do is spray it on the plastic sheet like this and let it cure for about a day. How do you get your masonry to look so real? Well, the realistic effect of brick and stone comes from simulating the mortar. Now take some Flocal Poly S White and this stuff is water-based. You want to thin it with about 30% water. And just brush it on the brick, just like this. And once you get it on the brick, work it in real good, and once you get it on the brick, you want to start wiping it off immediately. And you can see that it's flowing into the crevices here, simulating mortar. You just want to wipe off the top surface of the brick and leave it in the low areas. Now, you can use poly S gray if this white's a little bit too white for you. That's about all we do to this. It's simple. 
Now we do the same basic thing to simulate stone. First choose a suitable color for the stones that would come from the area that you're modeling. Why don't we do light tan? And for that, we're going to use uh, a, a color from Pactor, which is light earth. And what we want to do is we just want to coat this on, this casting, just like this. Make sure you work it into the grooves, okay? Don't get it too heavy. And as soon as you get it on, you take a rag that's been soaked with thinner, okay? Lay it down and just wipe this off. We want to take this off the face of the stones, leaving some stones light and some stones dark. And do a few of the individual stones using the focal stains like maple. Just flow it on different areas, okay? Do the different stones. And what is a good rule of thumb is do maybe two or three stones of the same color in a given area. Maybe we want to use a little... Uh, Roof brown, which is a darker color. Come right over here like this. Do a few of the stones in the same area. Okay? Just about like that. Now, foundation's a good color. It's a light tan color. And we want to come in and do a few of those stones with this color. Just like that, right there. Okay, without having to do this whole casting, what I would probably do then is uh, go to the poly -S white. Wet the area with water, okay? This area like this. Just get some water in the groove so it will take the paint. Come back with the poly S. Flow it in there, just like this. Immediately, you want to wipe it, okay? You want to wipe that off. Now, see how that stays in the grooves? And it really simulates modern very well. Malcolm, that still looks too new. Uh, how do you get the crumbled stone effect? Well, here's how I do that. Now, if you're going to bust this up and make it look like it's cracked and crumbling plaster, the thing to do first is to coat the backside with surgical gauze. And you can do that with gauze and white glue, okay? Then you want to take a little hammer, and you don't have to hit it very hard, but you just want to bust this, okay? Different places. And the gauze will keep this thing from flying apart. And you could even mash this around and make sure that the cracks come out really good. Oh, yeah. Remove some of the stones uh -huh. or whatever, you know, because you're going to go back in and fill in. And then the thing to do is to lay this back over flat, recoat with white glue, okay? And that way it'll become rigid again. You can pick it up and then position it on the layout. We've just gone through the general weathering techniques and the basic model materials. Okay, we have wood and plastic, metal and plaster. Now, that was quite a crash course, actually. And once you start putting these techniques and methods into practice, you realize just what a body of knowledge we covered. You should feel pretty confident and comfortable with your abilities once you start doing these techniques. If we didn't know anything about realism, the town of Tin Cup on my San Juan Central would look like this. It's my preference that most weathering be worked into a model prior to construction. But it can be done afterward, too. If you're just starting, You've probably bought your first kit, and you probably can't wait to put the thing together without weathering it. Let's take one of these buildings that started out as a kit and apply some weathering. Let's see if we can work in a little character. You already know how. I'm impressed, but what about all the little details on a building? Now, if you'll observe, we'll deal with some of those fine details and the finishing touches that are done after the building is actually constructed, such as water sediment, rain stains around the downspouts, some window treatments. Let me show you how to do some of that weathering on this building. Now, we want to simulate rain stains on the roof. A good way to do that is to scrape off some white chalk on a piece of paper, dip your brush in it, and with a downward motion, Start your rain streaks. Vary the length of the rain streaks. Some are long, some are short. If your hand is a little bit moist, you see, see how that takes it off? If you get a little bit too much on there, you can blend it in a little bit better. I've got some cracked glass in the window. In these, some of these old buildings in Colorado, the area that I model, there's a lot of cracked glass. So the way that I do that, I take a piece of clear acetate, okay? And uh, you can go in here and say this is the length of your window, just take your X-Acto blade, number 11, and make a jagged cut. You don't have to cut all the way through the plastic. Take it out to the end and just work 
work your crack up like that, you see. Have the little splits, cracks that come off of it. Not too much. You don't want to overdo it. That's all there is to that. Then you can, of course, cut your plastic and then glue it onto your building where the window goes. Another thing we want to touch on is like downspouts. Okay, we have one here. A way that that can be uh, weathered up a bit, we take this rust mixture. This is roof brown and floquel rust, okay? And we could just dab it on here and there. You don't want to cover all of the downspout because it probably wouldn't be really rusted unless it was very, very old. But we could just kind of touch it here and touch it there just to take the sheen off a few places where the water would collect. And now the final step, the piece de resistance, as I call it. I take the structure and I dry brush it with poly -S white along the edges, just like this. Windows, everything. You want to pop the way the sunlight hits the building, just pop it out, just like that. Everything gets dry brushed. I dry brush everything on the building. That's it. Learn to use your eyes and see these highlights in real life. My eyes become educated to light and shadow because of my uh, interest in photography. When I have an architectural photo assignment, those highlight details make the difference between a good picture and a great one. I believe the same is true in modeling. See the difference? Hey, hey we, we hate, hate to rush, but we've got, got to meet a train. Most of the rolling stock in HO scale is ready to run plastic kits. They come already painted and lettered. A few minutes of work and you're ready to roll and weather. Atherin, MDC, uh, McKean, Details West, Lifelike, Train Minotaur are some of the uh, ready-to-run kit manufacturers. There are also craftsman kits for the more industrious model. Those include E&B Valley, uh, Bell, Quality Craft, and Northeastern. Since ready-to-run is so popular, I'm going to weather some of these plastic car kits right out of the box and show you that even an inexpensive plastic car can be made to look very realistic. The difference between a yard full of unweathered cars and a yard full of weathered cars is just really startling. And my approach to weathering is somewhat like nature. I try to apply colors where nature would apply it. I try to subtract colors off the car where nature would uh, remove it, or at least simulate the removal. I do my weathering with an airbrush and a hand brush. I use the local weathering colors and pastel chalks, and I also use my box of dirt. Remember now that the basic techniques for weathering structures apply to rolling stock. Other than normal weathering and aging, it applies to just about any material exposed to the elements. Rolling stock accumulates dust, grime, and rust in a, in a way that's different from stationary objects. So let's learn to dust and rust, grime with time, and grease with ease, and, and just kind of show the toll that uh, cross-country travel takes on rolling stock. Okay, this is a lifelike, ready-to-run car. But as you can see, it's painted and lettered. But for it to fit on my layout or any layout that's realistic, it needs a little work. It just... Uh, it's too shiny. It needs a little weathering. It's just not right. And I'm using light gray pastel that will show up well against the dark uh, Tuscan boxcar that we're going to use. Go ahead and get a, a real nice pile of this stuff. We're going to take the brush, dip it into the chalk in this way here, and just kind of streak it onto the car. And you can see how it's beginning to attach itself to the car. And you can make it in a streaking manner like so. Now, you can, you can do this light, or you can do it he heavy. You know, you can use your eyes. It, it depends on what kind of weathering you want your car to have. You know, you can study prototype weathering on rolling stock and determine for yourself how you want your car to look. Okay, this technique produces a very subtle and natural coloring, giving the effect of dirt and grime that was blown onto the car. You can see how effective this is. Okay, after you've applied the chalks and you're happy with the result, the next step is to seal the chalk to the car. You want to use a flat finish. Flocal makes a good brand of flat finish that you can use for this. Just take the, the finish and you want to kind of turn the car a little bit. You don't want to get too close to the car with this finish and just kind of spray it on lightly. And once it dries, you don't need a lot of this. Once it dries, it will, the, the chalks will, will show through this finish. That looks great, Malcolm, but what about uh, using an airbrush for weathering? Yeah, I use an airbrush to do the underneath of the car, the trucks, the couplers. This thing can provide you some real quick magic. Okay, the couplers and the trucks get really rusty, and on top of the rust, there's all that dust and grime. Okay, as you can see, the trucks and couplers on this model are a little bit too shiny, and they just look unnatural and not weathered. What I want to do is apply a little rust to this undercarriage and to the trucks and couplers with an airbrush. And what I like to use is roof brown, and I take a little rust, local rust, and I add it to the roof brown to cut it a bit. 
Use a little bit of thinner, about half and half, 50-50 mixture, and just run it through the airbrush. Start the mixture flowing through the airbrush. Now, it doesn't take much. As you can see, this goes on pretty heavily here, and you can just weather this under here, weather the under frame. A little rust, because that's where it would accumulate. You might want to apply a little bit to the sides of the car, just to the side, just a little bit, just a little overspray, just like that, see? Because the rust would accumulate underneath where the door slides. Steps, the ladder, a little bit of rust. You know, nature provides lots of colors for dust and grime from the rails of the open road. Red clay in Louisiana and Georgia, black dirt in Michigan and Wisconsin, maybe brown soil in Illinois and Iowa, white and yellow sands in the western deserts. So all cars don't get the same color dirt. You know, you need to go out and watch trains as they roll down the track. Just mix your own colors. You can use your eye and just determine the shades by the way you look at prototype weathering on cars. What I'm going to do in a real safe way to go here is to use a little concrete gray from Floquel. It's a light gray color. Hit the edges of the roof with this gray because we're going to try to simulate dust. Hit the sides, turn the car on its side to where you just want to skim in the edges. See how it pops the rivets out? Pops the door detail out. Turn the car around. Be careful how you handle it because you don't want to smear what you've already done. Highlight the sides of the car just like that. Want to get the ends too. And we'll come back in a little bit with a brush and kind of provide a streaking motion with the brush and weather it a little bit more. A nice way to simulate rain streaks on the side of a car is with clear thinner. I use the Flocal brand clear thinner and a real good stiff bristle brush. What I've done here is I've taken this Flocal thinner and I've put it in this funky old jar of that used to be paint and uh, it's empty now. We just applied the thinner in there. You want to take the car like this, dip the bristle brush into the thinner, just put a little bit of thinner onto it, streak it down the sides of the car, okay? Just like this right here. See how it washes some of this paint off, streak it. It doesn't take much, just a little bit. Just wet it, and after it dries, you'll see that uh, there'll be some bright red areas show through and some dark red areas. Try to keep the streaks fairly uh, uniform. Okay, be sure you cover the roof, too, because it gets a lot of rain, a lot of dust and rust. Just go over the whole car with this dry brushing technique. Now, what we've used here is a combination of airbrush, pastel chalk, and the dry brushing with uh, the Plocal Thinner. And you can see it produces a pretty nice car, but later on, we can even get this thing ready for the rip track. Say, Malcolm, come on over here and show us how you'd weather these cars. They've got specialized uses. Yeah. Uh, you know, use your chalks on them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> is it okay to start with the caboose? Let's do that. Okay. Most railroads kept their cabooses, cabise, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> fairly clean, but what we want to do is what I like to do is simulate a little faded paint. Now, we can do this by, uh, uh, you know, you can see that this is a dark green. Mm -hmm. Okay, we take a lighter color, about two shades lighter color uh, chalk, scrape it out onto this uh, workbench here, this paper, dip the brush in, and just start streaking down the sides like this. And I'll show you a little trick we can do here. We can take this, rub it on, and then you can take your finger. Your finger's a little bit moist anyway. It has a little uh, oil to it, and you can just kind of pull that chalk into place to where it looks like it's faded around the edges. Yeah, it does, it really, it? really comes off looking pretty good. What about a, a passenger car now? Sure. Since you've done the caboose, let's see what the passenger car would. I like to use gray. It's kind of a general weathering color. We can just kind of dip in here and just kind of do the same thing. There's not going to be a whole lot of weathering to these. They, they, they usually ran these through the washers. Yeah, and, uh, they kept them pretty clean. Yeah, right? but you can do the underneath here. Just kind of bring it up the sides like this and streak sure. it. Yeah. And uh, because it would pick up, you know, road dust. Yeah, and you put some on the trucks too, I guess. Sure, so yeah. You know, you can maybe a little highlight the trucks a little bit. You know, later on we could come back and even dry brush with acrylic white here. What about the hopper car? Okay. This hopper car, what we want to do here, you know, they carried things like cement and uh, uh, powder type goods in this. What I do is uh, I simulate that by maybe dipping in a little white here that I've mm. already put out on the paper. Just streak this down from the hatches. Oh, yeah. To where that they would, uh, you know, when they were loading the car. That's a nice effect. Yeah, and it just, just streak it right on down mm -hmm. there. Even cover a little bit on the hatches where the material has gone in. What about a stock car? Okay, stock cars carried cattle. 
pigs, things like that, sheep. So we would want to uh, here possibly Absolutely. show how we lime can, stains or something. Yeah, lime deposits. Now what I like to use is floquel polyester. You come along here to simulate lime deposits. Just kind of dab it, dab it on here, dab it on there. Come back and get the water, and just streak this down. Okay. Let it flow on here. Oh yeah. See how that does? You want to get it thin to where it's just kind of like a wash, actually. Now, of course, we haven't weathered this car. No, but and, I'm and just, you would before that, but yeah. we just want to show uh, some specialized uses. What about the tank car? Now, that's going to be a little different. That's going to be carrying chemicals or oil. Yeah, after oh. oil sits for a while on a car and it picks up dust, a lot of people think it's shiny, but it's not really that shiny. It's just a kind of a dull coating of black. Now, what, what you can do here is just dab it on right in this area here. Get this where the camera can see what we're doing here. Dab it on, and it would flow down okay in kind of a flowing manner and just streak it down it would accumulate around in this area yeah, here and right yeah. on down okay cars like this carried bulk loads of, of steel and iron and things that were very heavy subsequently they uh, incurred a lot of damage and what we're going to try to do is take a soldering iron to simulate some of this damage that has occurred what you want to do is just pass this soldering iron close by the body of the car the sides okay like so and you know you can barely touch it. You don't want to. You don't want to lay this soldering on there, soldering iron on there, because it will actually, you know, just eat right through the sides. You can take your finger and start testing the sides. See now it's already getting pliable enough to where we can bend it a little bit. Also, you want to come along the tops. Just kind of run it over the tops. Don't really touch it. Just get the heat close to it. Okay, and it'll start going. And when it starts getting warm, you can press the tops down. Push it out. See, I'm pushing it out with my finger now. It's not really that hot, but see, you can, you can distort the sides of the car to where you actually have this bulge, if the camera can pick that up. And you have like a, a low damaged gondola. During the course of the time that we were using a soldering iron Allen, we did put a hole in the side of the car. Yeah, how are you gonna not fix it? to worry, not to worry. Here's a car that I've done with the San Juan Central. This side, you can see that we weathered up, beat up. But on the other side, we did, and, and if the camera can pick this up, actually put a hole in the side when we touched it. Okay, and we can, uh, uh, you know, just kind of go around the other side and see where I did apply the patches. Mm -hmm. All right, Malcolm, let's see how you weather a car so it's ready for the rip track. Listen, the techniques here, Alan, are, are probably a little bizarre. Oh. I mean, you know, it's my kinky weathering method. <laughs> okay, we'll take the car that we weathered previously with the airbrush and the chalks and everything because it's already pretty weathered and it looks pretty, uh, pretty old right now, but we're going to take it a step further. Now, what I, I do here, uh, I, I just use common dirt okay that's the only way i can say it i can't say it any clearer than that common dirt just put the car in the dirt and get dirty with it dump the dirt on the car and just make sure that you cover all the areas what you can do too is you know as, as you pile this dirt up on the sides of the car brush some of the rocks away the bigger rocks take your finger just rub that stuff in there okay just rub it in look how it's already started to make this thing look like it's just ancient you know, you can brush it off. Use your fingers a lot, man. This is a, this a place where you can get in and get messy. Yeah, you really are getting messy. Listen, everything yeah. I do is messy. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are other kinds of dirt you can, you can buy in the hobby store. Right. You see how that accumulates there, though? It looks like yeah. patches of rust sure and everything uh -huh. else. It really looks good. Okay, uh, what, you do, what do you do next? Okay, what I do next is I take a little brush like this. Now, see, you can see where this dirt is laying up there. Yeah. Dip it in clear, flocal thinner. Okay. Okay. Just touch it. I put a little bit too much on there, but you want to just touch it. Just touch it. That makes it set. Yeah, it sets. And it looks like where, uh, you know, you have patches of rust. Yeah. Just run it down the rivets there. Patches of rust. Let me clean this brush a little more here. It's picking up what we did previously. It doesn't take much just to lock it in. Look at that. Look, see how it bleeds through? Yeah. Because it almost makes it like a porous type mm -hmm. substance. Mm -hmm. And it just really adds a lot of weathering technique to it. Okay, now that's the three ways that I like to weather a car. And uh, oftentimes I'll intermix all three methods to achieve the result you see here? You know, in the steam era, a car like that would have been pulled by a smoke-belching monster. That's right. Yeah. So I think you're ready for this now, Malcolm. Gee, Alan, I didn't know you cared. Well, sure I cared. I brought that all the way from Milwaukee. You're one of my favorite modelers. And oh. besides, you're ready for it now. So why don't you show us how to weather a steam engine? Right, okay. Let me get the bow off here, and we'll just dig right in and see what we've got. Okay, now, don't rush me and give me plenty of elbow room. Because these things take time. You know, in the steam era, Alan, 
The tenders and locomotives got dirtier than any of the rolling stock, but they received more maintenance and were kept cleaner. And if you'll page through some steam era books, you'll see uh, some steam engines look quite worn and weathered, and uh, others look like they were clean and, and possibly even museum pieces, even though they were still being used and had seen hundreds and thousands of miles. But I really think diesels were cleaner. Now, that's not necessarily so. Huh? What, what's going on? I said that's not necessarily so. I could stay cleaner myself on a steam engine than I could a diesel. Who are you? Come on up and I'll tell you about a steam engine. Hey, sounds great. I'm just an old timer. They used to call us hogheads back in steam engine days. I think the steam engines were cleaner than the diesels because I've sat right here in one of these cabs and mm -hmm. logged thousands and thousands of miles, and I stayed pretty clean. Of course, you could get pretty dirty if you happen to get a bad steamer. A steam engine cooking right puts out very little smoke. Uh, it's it's not like in the movies. Black smoke really usually meant trouble. Now, both the engineer and the fireman have gauges to watch. Steam pressure gauge, which tells you how much steam pressure you've got. A water glass gauge indicating how much water's in the boiler. And the exhaust comes out of the stack with the heat from the firebox. Now, steam lines run all over the engine. They heat and power most things, but sometimes they leak. And over a period of time, the steam causes rust and leaves mineral deposits from the water used in the boiler. Also, pay attention to rivets and bolts. Look at the cylinders. When you start an engine, you blow water out of the cylinder cocks with steam. Another spot for more stains and rust. Malcolm? Uh-huh. You see all these running gears? Oh, yeah. Side rods? Right. They're being constantly lubricated all the time they're running. Uh-huh. Which tend to pick up dust and grime. Listen, thanks so much for all the weathering tips in the tour. Anytime, Sonny. It's on the house. <laughs> Why don't we jump right in and weather this little devil? I like to start with a little, you know, flocal grimy black, and I uh, thin it with a little mixture of 50-50 diosol. Okay. Through my airbrush, I shoot the whole engine and the tender and all. It lightens the black so it shows rivets and running gear better. Usually, I lay the engine on a block like this so I can shoot up and underneath, and it's easier to get around it all, taking care maybe to mask off the drive rods if you don't want to weather those. There, I let that harden for about a week. Now, this engine is dried and is ready for some weathering. Why don't we get into some specific weathering? You know, it's like the old hog head told us, anywhere there's rivets and bolts, steam can leak. Look through the books and you'll see the lines around the fittings are rusted where water is leaked. Sometimes the smoke box front will show rust. I simulate this using rust-colored chalk. I like to use a brush around the smoke box front. Also, I'll hit few rust stains along some of the fittings just around the top and along the running boards. You know, from the observations of the uh, few steam engines that I've studied and the photographs I've looked at, I can see that there's a lot of white stains as well as a whole lot of rust stains added there. It's especially the white on the steam lines outside and just below the cab, and around the pistons and next to those air pumps, and of course around the steam whistle and the pop valves. Now, I want to take some poly -S white, and I've thinned it with some water to a wash. This can simulate the white stains, you know, calcium, lime, whatever. But first, I'll uh, hand brush these areas with a little plain water, and then I'll follow those same lines with a poly -S wash. Why don't we go for some grease and grime? The tender, the running gear, and the drive rods really got dirty. I'm going to use a fine double O brush and some grimy black, just, you know, straight out of the bottle here to simulate this grease and grime.
Now I'd like to use some uh, concrete gray, thin 50-50, and just spray straight up. This will simulate the uh, rain wash and the rain stains on the tender and running gear. Now I'm going to weather this tender with a lot of grease and grime, you know, primarily on the top where the coal load would go. You know, they tried to keep these things clean, but this one here has been on the road for a lot of miles. Now I'll put the engine back on the block, you know, possibly dry brush the running gear like so, and the underframe with uh, some poly S white straight out of the bottle. The drive rods need a little, you know, engine black stain or a little engine black straight out of the bottle to simulate grease on the drive rods. Let me place this on the track. There now, isn't that a beaut? That sure is, Malcolm. That's a weathered engine, and that's a weathered railroad. As they say down here in Texas, you've done good. I've done good. You know, to the weathering stage, it's almost mechanical. I mean, building a model railroad layout is theoretically a matter of just following steps. But uh, weathering, as far as I'm concerned, is the essential artistry of model railroading. Yeah, it runs good, huh? Sure does. And rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you when he gets past this week. All right, go ahead. Excuse me, I know you fellas are real busy. Hi, honey. Come on in, we're just wrapping up the program. I'm off to work. Off to work? Yes, but when I get back day after tomorrow, I'm gonna have two whole days off. So we're really gonna show you Dallas. See you later. Have a good day. Hey, she's a sweetheart, Malcolm. Really? What does she do anyway? Alan, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Career woman? Really? 